So I've been playing Final Fantasy XII. Nipple Gillette, androgynous Shota. Oh shit, what do you mean that's a dude? It's totally not like I jacked off the that the other day. These are all titles I've seen used to describe our hero Vaughn. When a game starts, he's aladdining it up at a local market, when all of a sudden some asshole dictator comes to his city of residence. As it turns out, war done happened. And Bishy Boy over here is totes Hitlering all neighboring countries. And of course, Vaughn won't stand for this and tries to infiltrate the celebratory ball or some shit in order to rob in some hoods. But as JRPG tradition would have it, shit goes tits up. He bumps into a bunch of other people and ends up in a huge fucking political conflict that goes way over his head. And that's pretty much where Final Fantasy XII starts distancing itself from most other JRPGs as instead of focusing heavily on our band of heroes, it tells a story of war, poverty, riches, racism, economics, religion, and lots of old white men with beards and stern British accents. Basically, this shit is about as western as a JRPG can possibly get. They even do that thing where motherfuckers be all high fantasy-like, saying shit along the lines of I know not, instead of I don't know. And where some people get super rock hard over that shit, I honestly prefer my characters to speak a bit more casually, but there you go. As far as Final Fantasy goes though, this one at least has plenty of fantasy for once. The same can be said for the soundtrack as well, as it's composed of a cacophony of generic sweeping orchestral music that's actually really fucking pretty. It fits like a dick up Vaughn's ass either way though, and while it's not really my type of jam in general, I can't really fault the game for it either. Hey, look, it's a mogul. To be calling it generic high fantasy though would really be shafting it of some of the credit it deserves, as it draws from a wealth of cultures in terms of its locales and their general design. Well, <laughs> mainly Middle Eastern, but there's also a shit ton of Europe and even a bit of Asia thrown in there and it looks pretty fucking great if you ask me. I mean, there's sprawling swamps, huge epic forests, giant dark dungeony temples and abandoned mine shafts that are all brought to life with quite an insane amount of detail. But the area where these cultural influences are most prevalent is in the game's cities. From the cramp and densely pecked bazaar and sewage dwellings in Rebanaster, to the skyscrapers and flying trams in Arcades, I fucking love it, mate. Shit's atmosphere incarnate, and I had quite a lot of fun exploring all of these places, just panning around the camera and admiring the art. Like, look at all of these different kinds of flora and fauna, and the various weather types and lighting conditions that affect them. Wow. Everything in this shitty little item shop must have taken days, if not weeks, to model and texture, only for some asshole to just run on through ignoring all of it. And they don't just blatantly copy paste this shit either. Sure, the odd teacup might reappear here and there, but even then, dude, I still respect the ever living fuck out of this game's attention to world building so very, very much. Contrary to most of Square's RPGs, this isn't the game that only impresses with its grandeur, but with its finer details as well, as instead of having unenterable buildings be nothing more than a texture, for instance, they <laughs> actually gave them tiny little interiors. And it's exactly that stupendously high level of craftsmanship that also shows itself in how the game presents its story. Oh my god, my segues are so on point. It's not like they're totally obvious. Wow. In Final Fantasy X and even in XIII, some of the cinematography and directing are a bit... Uh, Gary's Marty, for lack of a better term. But Final Fantasy XII fucking rocks my tit, mate. It's not at all cutscene heavy compared to its familia, but what is there is quite possibly some of the best the series has to offer. I mean, just look at this shot. Other installments tend to have that Oh shit, we have all of this dialogue, we need there to be something Directing resulting in endless shot reverse shots and camera pans But here there isn't such an exorbitant amount of dialogue in the first place Leading to all cutscenes being very unexpository And I think that deserves some praise Like, if you have well over a billion flashbacks in your game You'll likely start pussying out and just slap some hazy filters over shit. But if you have one really important flashback that actually explains some stuff, you'll have the time to think about how to convey that in a cinematically engaging way. It's all very focused, I guess. Every shot establishes something relevant and is also nice to look at. 
Which definitely makes the war speak laden bullshit that isn't really my kind of thing actually a lot more intriguing than it would have been otherwise. Just kind of a shame that our main protagonist had to be such a massive cuck. It's a little over my head sometimes. Good, Vaughn. You've come to understand the difficulties of serving royalty. Hey, I'm just along for the ride. I'm just along for the ride. If the story is to be considered a departure from JRPG traditions, then the gameplay sure as fuck is as well. Gone are the characters standing on opposite sides of each other, the random encounters or being teleported to a separate screen and not being able to walk around freely. Instead, you get what is, in essence, a single player MMO. <laughs> The screen cluttering UI, the sword hits that may or may not actually connect, the endless dungeons, and also a hefty fucking dose of looting, selling, and raiding are all present and accounted for. Though beneath the surface, there are also still a lot of weird Final Fantasy style system and mechanics hanging around, like the license board, which is this place where you buy the license to be able to use certain abilities and weapons. So like, if you buy a new magic spell or a piece of succulent armor, you can't just straight up use it right away cause that would be silly. No, you need license points. What you get from killing monsters then spend on this big chessboard looking thing to acquire said license. And as you do, it'll keep expanding with every purchase to accommodate for all of the new shit being introduced in shops as the game continues. <laughs> Like I said, weird Final Fantasy style systems that kind of make the base RPG mechanics a lot more complicated than they maybe ever should have been. The combat in any case definitely has something very MMO-y about it, as in that you only need to select an attack once for your character to just keep going until the target be dead. I think RuneScape did that as well, which might sound like a bit of a weird comparison, but that's the only MMO I ever played, you guys, so please no bully. But yeah. There's a line drawn between you and your target, and you can open menu to intervene at any time to tell your dudes to do shit, but you don't have to mash buttons Kingdom Hearts style, or select commands over and over right on the spot JRPG style. And because of that, there is some dependence on AI, which could have been a fucking train wreck worthy of a Konami press event. But instead, this is where the Gambit system comes into play. Welcome to the 2010 Konami E3 press conference. The Gambit system more or less allows you to hand program your own AI scripts. You do that by assigning tasks to the three main facets of a Gambit, one being designated for a target, the other being its goal or purpose, and the last being for the skill you want to do the job. For instance, set it to ally HP at 40% and then add a potion so when that ally's HP will drop below 40, the party member with that gambit installed will then use a potion. Or you could set it to enemy attacking ally and then add an attack command so they'll go off and physically assault said enemy should it be attacking one of their friends. And the order in which you set these gambits will define their priority in battle. So. Even if you have one set to heal, if it's all the way at the bottom of a bunch of attack gambits, that character will keep attacking as long as there are dudes around as they're programmed to prioritize offense. Overall, it's a system that's fairly easy to learn, but also has a fuck ton of depth to it once the game takes off properly. Which <laughs> takes quite a fucking while. You see, Final Fantasy XII is fucking huge, which is great by just about all means, but it's also designed in a way where not only items and skills are to be purchased at store, but the Gambinos are as well. And naturally, only a very small selection is available for even as far as up to the first 20 to 30 hours. Which means that you'll see your dudes do pretty much the same old shit over and over again. Especially the first four hours can be a bit very fucking painful as you only have about two party members at most. Get ready for a lot of waiting on bar. Though when shit does finally take off, it takes off fast. Look at it go. Whoosh. Like I said, the Gambit system allows for a lot of freedom and complexity in regards to how you want to handle your dungeoneering. I mean, they need to take into account for every status effect, enemy type, buff or debuff, and all of the spells and techniques you and your enemies have at their disposal. So already, <laughs> that creates quite a daunting list of shit, considering you have a total of six characters, all with their own sets of gambits. 
Yay for micromanagement, I guess. And combined with the overall rather passive battle system, I can see this game being really fucking boring to traditional JRPG fans. For me personally though, seeing my own pre-planned technical thinking unfold during a boss battle or effortly raid an entire fucking dungeon was really quite satisfying. But I'd be lying if I said that a large part of my playthrough didn't consist out of me admiring the art whilst the battle system played itself. In any case, I gloss over this before, but besides you needing a license to be able to buy equipment, all abilities, spells, and even gambits are to be purchased at stores. Besides this, giving the game a bit of a slow start due to some mild overall pacing issues, it does make the act of dungeoneering a very addictive affair. Thing is, when you kill enemies, they drop loot, and loot can be exchanged for money at stores. On a service level, that already gives the game a type of raid design style, being that all shops are back in town, so heading off into a dank cave, conquering and cashing in your spoils adds a good build up to your eventual reward. Though this does make it so that very little actual stat progression happens within the dungeons themselves besides occasional level ups. But in an attempt to keep this from becoming too pointless and monotonous, they introduced a very neat little chain system where killing multiple enemies of the same enemy type in a row will increase the quality of loot drops and also raise the amount of XP and license points gained in battle. Naturally, this is also highly exploitable, but it never failed to pull me in every time when paired with the thick as fuck atmosphere and general design. Again, it's a very passive battle system and most mechanics are very subdued and might not actually be contextually satisfying to everyone as a result, but I do feel very comfortable in saying that if you enjoy the likes of Diablo or any number of cheeky MMO, this shit might be right up thine alley. So yeah, besides a few little niggles here and there, all of that mechanical good stuff is generally considered to be rather good stuff. And there are a few other things as well that I absolutely enjoy. Like how all of the dungeons are designed like large sprawling mazes that often loop back around metroidvania style. With locked doors, traps and mild environmental puzzles that break up the monotony and allow for a good sense of exploration and progression. Not to mention how most if not all of these dungeons are interconnected through this cave like system that runs beneath almost the entire world map. And a lot of it's optional too. In general, I'd say that they probably realized how potentially boring the combat might be to traditional JRPG fans, and thus they really gave it their all to spruce up every single aspect of every single thing regarding grinding. And that's pretty fucking great. So let's get into some of the things that absolutely suck dick. I'd have to give you back your piece too. We're just dying, by the way. If you can find a pink one... I was just about to say, if I'm gonna buy one, it'll be pink. Ah, <sighs> fine. One thing I'd like to get out of the way first is the fact that they actually remade the game under the title, The International Zodiac Version. Yeah. The main reason that they did this is, as it is now, it's really easy to end up with characters that are all exactly the same. You see, when in item store, you can obviously see which weapons boost which stats for all characters as you scroll along. So far so good, right? Well, the problem with this is, is that it'll only show their attack and defense. And there is one weapon class that literally shits on everything else strength rise. Strengths being the axes. And seeing those bright blue numbers perk up like that is pretty darn sexy. And sure, there isn't technically anything stopping you from consistently buying newer iterations of bows for one character and guns or daggers for another, making a well-balanced party. But as I said, not only are the axes always by far the strongest, the license board doesn't really accommodate for a good balance either. As besides some minor differences here and there, all of the boards are just about exactly the same. So in short, the game's general design is very actively steering you away from creating a well-balanced party and almost involuntarily makes you go full tank. 
But wait, you say. Surely the enemies are designed around this where hulking out like a complete mong will punish you. Well, no. Decking yourself out with nothing but axes is actually so very fucking OP that <laughs> even the monsters more or less designed for a certain type of weapon will still get their shit kicked in with a single swing. Either way, this point has probably been made before, but Final Fantasy XII is easier to break than Grand Grand's brittled bones. I've fallen. And I can't get up! Something else that definitely annoyed me, myself, and I was a thing the game likes to do that I'm going to call NES tier bullshit. Things like really cryptic hints to very specific triggers one really can't figure out without having a type of guide or walkthrough. I think they did this to just have him in there as neat little chance encounters you can stumble across while grinding, but having played through this with the biblical ass strategy guide as a kid, it became very apparent to me how much of a living hell this game must have been for completionists. It has ridiculous shit like time chests with rare items or OP as fuck enemies that can randomly appear under the game's many weather types. And it even has the fucking audacity to turn your trusted friend the save crystal into a potential trap. Imagine being completely down on your luck after a massive boss or a lengthy ass dungeon session only to get mullered by the fucking save point. You love it. Which is great especially as dying sets you back to the fucking title screen. No loads, no checkpoints, no mercy. In a way, I also kind of respect the game's dedication to old school assholery and it is definitely a tad reminiscent of earlier outings from its director Yasumi Matsuno like Vagrant Story. And it even has some mild CRPG vibes about it as well. Well, if you zoom out all the way, it even kind of looks like one. But considering how long, slow and grind heavy the game is in general, it pulling shit faced little tricks like this is not exactly a good thing in my book. And lastly, the only other thing that bothers me are some very odd little bits of contextual design that'll get increasingly more annoying as you play along. Like how when you kill an enemy, there's this small one second window where its corpse is still treated like a solid object, thus taking some time before you can get your loot on. Then there's also some stuff regarding the battle menu where quite often it'll pop up when you're trying to grab a chest, which niggles away at you every time it occurs. And last and most definitely thank fucking god I'm almost done reading this shit least, some lack of streamlining in the gambit menu. Mainly not being able to copy, paste, or save certain Gambit setups. I mean, <laughs> shit already takes long enough as it is. So at least just let me dump a single Gambo configuration onto one of my other dudes for fuck's sake. Simply decking out your entire party with something as all-purpose as when poisoned, cure poison should not have to be this tedious. So yeah, this was fucking hell to voice and write, but a rootin' tootin' good old time to actually play through. And it only took me a few months. It's good though, definitely not perfect, but keep in mind that this game is fucking huge, so naturally some things will be less polished than others. I sadly lack the save file to prove this, but when me, two of my friends, and my Final Fantasy XII Bible sat down one summer as but we children, I nearly invested 200 hours into this bad boy and got pretty darn close to actually beating it 100%. Well, as far as the side quests go anyway. And hey, it's even getting an HD remaster pretty soon as well, which while it totally holds up better than most PS2 games graphically, being that it already runs at 60x9, it could certainly do with some less audio file compression and maybe a little bit of anti-aliasing. And I do believe the remaster is of the Zodiac version also, so most if not all balancing issues what I mentioned earlier should be dealt with. Anyway, there's still some stuff I wanted to say regarding the plot, but meh. I think I've said my piece. Game good, combat good, story good, main character, absolute bitch.